surprising statistics to share with you this morning. 27% of our nation's children live in single parent homes. Now 45% of those single parent homes are a result of divorce. Almost 1% is a result of one of the parents dying. And the other, get this, the other 36% of the nation's children are born to unmarried women. Overall, that means that 24 million children in the United States do not live with their biological fathers. Now, some girls that have been raised without fathers model themselves after their strong mothers, women who've persevered in supporting their family, and they say, we don't need men anyway. If they're there, good. If not, oh well. So maybe that's why a third of our children are born to women who are unwed. Maybe that's why we have strange programs like 16 and Pregnant or Dad Camp. But this tough attitude, this don't need them anyway attitude, ignores the facts that fatherless children are more likely to be poor. They are more likely to drop out of high school. They are more likely to, to, to struggle with behavior disorders, addictions, and mental illness. They are at higher risk for sexual abuse and suicide and ending up in jail. What would have happened if Mary became pregnant in America in the 21st century. Would Joseph have ever been able to get past the suspicion of adultery? Would a God-inspired dream been enough to soothe the hurt and calm his anger and frustration? Or would he simply have walked away, leaving Mary to raise the child on her own? Well, things were different in the first century. Well, mostly different. I think that Joseph first, when he was first told of Mary's pregnancy, I think he still might have asked with disbelief, how can this be? And I think he still would have felt that shock and anger and hurt and sadness. But his options were different. Firstly, he could have followed the law as prescribed in Deuteronomy 22, and had her stoned for becoming pregnant before their arranged marriage was consummated. But Joseph didn't do that because he was a merciful man. Instead, he had thoughts about quietly breaking the engagement. And that way the community would assume that he had fathered the child, and the shame would be his and not Mary's. But then God spoke to him in a dream and he decided to follow God's call. And he took on Mary as his wife, and he took on the unborn child as his son. Joseph was a compassionate man. He took on the hidden life of being Jesus' earth father. There's very little information about Joseph. Matthew writes about Joseph's obedience to God and the way he cared for and protected his family, but none of Joseph's words have been recorded anywhere in the Bible. There's no mention of him at the crucifix, crucifixion, and we're never told when he actually died. Yet, as Jesus' adoptive father, he would have played a big role in his upbringing. For example, Jesus' compassion at taking on the pregnant Mary is echoed in Jesus' compassion of feeding the 5,000. The patience that a carpenter has to sand all the splinters out of his work is shown in Jesus' patience at dealing with his disciples who were just so slow learning and just didn't get it time after time. We can see Joseph's ethic of hard work in Jesus' willingness 
to keep on teaching to all those crowds that followed him from mountainside to seaside. And most importantly, as an adoptive dad, it would have been Joseph who taught Jesus all the Jewish scripture, all the traditions, and all the prayers. Much of Joseph's contributions would have been hidden to others and visible to God. And yet, his life's work, Joseph's life's work, changed the life of the person who changed the whole world. <clears throat> Joseph's hidden parental care and support changed the life of Jesus, who brought salvation and changed the world. Now, I began today about talking about absentee fathers. But there are fathers who work hard to be good dads. There are men who work hard to be a positive influence in lives of children who are not their own. Stepdads and adoptive dads and foster dads and uncles and grandparents filling that father role. And like Joseph, their work is hidden but vital. When Elise and Richard Smith, my daughter and her new husband, were preparing to wed, Megan kept saying that she wanted to marry Richard. Now, we adults were pretty sure that she wanted to marry Richard because she wanted to wear a pretty dress and walk down the aisle and get lots of attention. But as the time grew closer and closer, and she already knew that she was going to be a flower girl and wear a pretty dress, she wouldn't let go of this. I want to marry Richard. And finally, some adult had the wisdom to say, why? And she said, I want to be family. She wanted that secure love of a family that has a dad. So on the day that Richard married Elise, during the ceremony, he called Megan over. And he knelt down so that he could be at her level. And he put a necklace over her neck and he said to her, I wanted to marry your mom because she's such a good mom and you're such a great kid. And she put her little hand up on his cheek. And at that moment, they became family. Elise and Richard continue to do the hard work of parents by teaching their children how to cope in this world and by teaching their children about the love of God. Matthew's story about Jesus' birth teaches us about parenting through the example of Joseph, but it also teaches us about the love of our Father in heaven. Father God did not abandon Joseph in the decision-making process. And he sent a message in a dream so that Joseph could discern the right course to take. He promised that Jesus would be a savior and he promised that God would be with Joseph. God would be with us, his continuing presence. God wants to father us, all of us. We are the sons and daughters of a kind, strong, engaged father, a father wise enough to guide us on the way, and generous enough to provide for that journey, and persistent enough to walk with us on every step. Sometimes the hardest thing for us is to believe that God wants to parent us. We have to move past our need for independence and our ways of either charging through life or shrinking from it and open our hearts to the possibility of walking through life with God. Our deepest search is for the strength and wisdom in time of need or even in our time of joy. This is the gift that Jesus gave us. He showed us how to go to prayer, how to go to God in prayer. And he gave us the Lord's Prayer. And he showed us that God is always yearning to be with us. He taught us that through the parables, the parables of the lost sheep. 
And he died so that we would be forgiven and always be able to go and have a good relationship with God. And yet we hold ourselves apart. It's like God's love's acts are too hidden from us. Now, maybe it's because we are one of those children that grew up fatherless. And that persistent absence clings to us more than the promise of God's presence. Maybe it's because we had a father who hurt us. And in some way we think we're protecting ourselves by holding ourselves apart. We can call ourselves Christian. We can go to church every week. We can live with the hope of heaven after we die. But we're not complete until we look to God for wisdom and strength. We have not received the whole gift until we allow ourselves to become children of God. So today I pray, I pray with joy that we don't have to be fatherless anymore. I pray that out of the brokenness of this world, we can turn to God and we can accept God's love. And like we sang at the very beginning when we lit the candles for Advent, I pray that each of us can look to that star child, Christ child, to be the go-between with God so that we can find healing for the hurt children of this world. And we can find wisdom for the spoiled children of this world. And we can find love and peace for the growing older children in this world. We can find God's love for us. I pray that we, together, look for and see God breaking into our lives, not just now in the season of Advent, but every day. Amen.